Welcome back to Calculus 2. We'd like to continue today with our discussion of uh, infinite series. And in particular, we'd like to introduce something that we call power series. Uh, we're going to give a few examples first, and then we'll go ahead and uh, define what we mean by a power series. But let's first, by, let's first begin by recalling something that we've seen already. Um, We've seen that uh, if I have a number r that, uh, that lives strictly between negative 1 and 1, that uh, adding together the powers of r gives, a, gives us a convergent series. In particular, we call this a, a geometric series. Right? So this would be a geometric series with ratio r, with r between negative 1 and 1. And, uh, what I want to do is just, oh, and notes, let's recall also that uh, for such a series, not only does it converge, but we know exactly to what it converges. It converges to the number 1 divided by 1 minus r. All right, we talked about this at length in some of our earlier discussions. But let's look what happens, visually anyway, by simply changing this symbol r to, to another symbol. In particular, what happens whenever I call that symbol x instead of r? Well, on the surface, nothing, absolutely nothing happens. Nothing changes. It's, it's, it's just a variable, right? If, uh, if this series was equal to 1 over 1 minus r, whenever I used r as my variable, the series, the same series, is going to equal 1 over 1 minus x whenever I use x as my variable. But while nothing changes substantially, it looks different to us, right? Using the letter x in there reminds us of functional notation. And in fact, that's what I want to do is I want to think about, I want to think about this expression as a function on the interval from negative 1 to 1 and recognize that uh, that this function at least on this interval is exactly the same as this function on this interval and in order to demonstrate that just a little bit more uh, concretely I'd like to uh, I'd like to look at some graphs of these two functions together. Um, what I have here is a sketch of the graph of uh, 1 over 1 minus x. But right next to it, I'd like to put some of the partial sums of the function 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on. For this function, let's see, so the function 1 plus x looks, uh, looks well, is the function graphed in blue. Uh, if I add another term, 1 plus x plus x squared, notice how the blue function is starting to hug the uh, 1 over 1 minus x function a little bit more closely. All right, let's uh, add another term. Right now, clearly the blue function is not equal to the red one. Uh, it it certainly starts to diverge rather markedly uh, whenever we get further and further away from zero. But at least uh, with uh, this power series up to x to the third, it's hugging very very tightly between negative a half and a half. Let's go another term. We expect it to hug a little bit, a little bit better even still. Yep, sure enough, we looks like looks like it uh, the blue and the red overlap uh, even a little bit beyond negative a half to a half. Let's do this just a little bit more efficiently. Let me uh, let me rewrite this in summation notation. We'll let n go from zero up to uh, well, let's see, we just had it up to four. Uh, function x to the n, right? So that's what we just looked at a moment ago. What, but, but now we can do this uh, a little bit more quickly. We can change things up to, up to 
x to the fifth, right up to x to the sixth, to x to the seventh, and look at that. It, it it's it's very very tight now. It looks like somewhere between about negative three quarters, up to uh, up to maybe positive positive three quarters somewhere around there. And the the higher we get, let's go up to x to the tenth. Very tight. X to the twentieth. Wow, almost indistinguishable for most of the interval between negative one and one. And if we just went crazy and went up to let's say the two hundred x to the two hundredth power, uh, we we virtually see no distinction at all between between the uh, graphs of the two functions. Now there literally is some distinction. These are not the same function. Uh, anywhere except at the number zero, I believe uh, there's there's some discrepancy, but but the uh, the lines uh, that we're using to draw the graph are are too wide to be able to to see that on the on the picture. Okay, so what we have there is a very uh, clear demonstration that uh, one over one minus x. Uh, gets closer and closer. I, actually, this these partial sums get closer and closer to the function one over one minus x as we take more and more terms uh, of this function, and it looks like that that's happening specifically on the interval from negative one to one. Let's look back one more time uh, and see what's happening outside that interval. Well, outside that interval. Um, Whenever we get just a little bit smaller than negative one, it it very clearly uh, diverges uh, quite a bit. Whenever we get beyond one, it doesn't look like there's uh, well, it's hard to hard to see what's going on. Uh, let's see if I can uh, move. Yeah, it's, ah, okay. So whenever we get uh, to one or, or beyond one, uh, the function one over one minus x takes on negative values. And so the functions are very distinct at that point. So go back to our whiteboard here. Okay, so let's say, so we've called this function right here f of x. And let's say that we're gonna, let's call this function over here g of x. So what we have here is that, well, this function f of x is equal to this function g of x. I'd like to use this function and this series to build new series for new functions. And this is actually very straightforward. Um, what I'm going to do is, for instance, I'm going to, let's take this function f of x and multiply it by x, right? Of course, that's going to give me the function x over 1 minus x, right? But if f of x and g of x are equal on this interval, it certainly seems reasonable that x times f of x should be equal to x times g of x on some interval. Maybe this one, we'll see. But what is x times g of x? Well, if, if this is g of x, then I'm going to get x times g of x by multiplying each of these terms by x. And so that's going to give me what? x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on. Well, on some interval. We'll worry about that later. All right. What are some other ways we could build, build some functions? Well, let's see. So we could take, uh, let's see, so this is The one method. Let's 
take, instead of looking at f of x, what if we looked at f of x squared, for example? Well, if f of x is equal to g of x, then f of x squared should equal g of x squared. And so that gives us that uh, one over, all right, so this function is going to be, so I'm gonna visit the function f. In every place I had an x before, I'm gonna replace it with an x squared. Well, I only have one instance of x. I'm gonna replace it with an x squared. And I'm gonna do the same with g, right? So if this is g of x, then g of x squared is the function I'm gonna get by replacing all of my x's here with x squareds. Okay, well, let's see, there aren't any x's in one. I'm gonna replace this x with x squared. I'm gonna replace this x with x squared, so I'm gonna get x squared squared, which is x to the fourth. And I'm gonna get x squared cubed, x to the sixth, and so on. Again, that's gonna be on some interval. Worry about that later. What are some other things I could have done? Um, well, one would expect that if f of x equals g of x, then let's say the derivative of f of x should equal the derivative of g of x. Now, what is the derivative of f of x? Now, let's see, I think uh, you can work that out pretty quickly, I believe. The, uh, if I write one minus x to the, I'll write it to the negative first power, because that's how we usually think about it whenever we're taking a derivative. We're gonna get negative, uh, what, one minus x to the negative second power times negative one using the chain rule. So negative one times negative one is positive one. Looks like what I've got is one over one minus x quantity squared. Okay, so that's the derivative of this side. So that is one over one minus x quantity squared. And that's gonna be equal to the derivative of g of x. Now the derivative of g of x is particularly easy. Just take the derivatives of the individual pieces. Derivative of one is zero. Derivative of x is one. Derivative of x squared is two x. Then we've got three x squared, four x cubed, and so on. On some interval. Right. And let's see, we could even do some, uh, we, could do, we could take some integrals, couldn't we? Here, let's, uh, let's go to another page. Let's, uh, let's consider, the, consider the integral of fx and the integral of g of x. All right, so we should have that the integral of f of x is equal to the integral of g of x. Now we're gonna to have to be a little bit careful here because these are both classes of functions, right? They're not, this is not a single function. This is, this is the class of all functions whose derivative is f of x. This is the class of all functions whose derivative is g of x. So we're gonna take that, we're gonna be careful about that. This is, uh, let's see, so this is the integral of one over one minus x dx. This is uh, the integral of one plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on. So 
So that means that uh, each function in this class is also going to be a function in this class over here. So let's see, this function, this is the, uh, this is the natural log of one minus X times negative one. And this is, let's see, X plus one half X squared plus one third X cubed plus one fourth X to the fourth and so on. And again, we don't know for sure that these two functions are identical, but we do know that this function is one of the members of the class of functions whose derivative is this function that we began with. Let's see if we can figure out what C would be. Well, notice that if X is zero, for example, all of these terms except for C vanish. Over here, if X is zero, what we're left with is the opposite of the natural log of one. Right, so that must mean that C is equal to the opposite of the natural log of one. Well, the natural log of one is zero. And so, it does turn out that C is equal to zero. And this tells me that the opposite of the natural log of one minus X is equal to X plus one half X squared plus one third X cubed and so on. which if I wanted to, I could use properties of logarithms to rewrite this as the natural log of uh, one over absolute value of one minus X. So here's another power series. This would be a power series for this function. Let's go back and do something similar to what we did um, here, except instead of replacing everything, all of our X's with X squared, so let's replace all, all of our X's with just X. I'm sorry, negative X. So let's look at F of negative X equal to G of negative X. Well, let's see, that would be one over one minus negative X equals one minus X plus negative X squared plus negative X cubed and so on. So that gives us, after simplifying just a bit, that one over one plus, uh, one over one plus X is equal to one minus X plus X squared minus X cubed plus X to the fourth and so on. And so that gives us this new series. And if we wanted to, we could, uh, we could take the integral of this one. See, antiderivative of one over one plus X 
Well, that would be exactly the natural log of one plus X. Antiderivative of this function would be X minus one half X squared plus one third X cubed minus one fourth X to the fourth plus one fifth X to the fifth and so on. Plus C, but using the same trick we used up here by replacing all of our X's with zero on this side, we're gonna get only C by replacing all of our X's over here by zero, we're gonna get log of one. So we're gonna get log of one is equal to C. So C is in fact zero. And so we have that the natural log of one plus X is in fact equal to this series right here. Now this is particularly interesting because right, we, while we haven't identified what interval this might be true on, I will tell you right now that it does happen to be true whenever X is equal to one. We'll show that in a little while, but for just a moment, I'd like you to take that on faith and notice that whenever X is equal to one, what we have over on this side is the natural log of, well, let's see, one plus one, get the natural log of two, Whenever X is one on this side, we have one minus one half times one squared plus one third times one cubed minus one fourth times one to the fourth and so on. And so what we wind up with is that the natural log of two is equal to one minus a half plus a third minus a fourth plus a fifth and so on, which is a fact that we stated without proof much earlier. We now have a reason to believe that the alternating harmonic series converges to the natural log of two. One more little fun fact. Let's, uh, let's start with this series again. Let's copy it down. One over one plus X is equal to one minus X plus X squared minus X cubed plus X to the fourth and so on. Let's replace all of our X's here with X squareds. and then replace all of our X's over here with X squareds. Let's see, X squared squared is X to the fourth. X squared cubed is X to the sixth. X squared to the fourth is X to the eighth and so on. All right, again, this is on some interval, we'll worry about those later. And if I take the antiderivative of both sides here, well, do you remember what the, the antiderivative of one over one plus X squared is? The indefinite integral of one over one plus X squared? Well, you may recall, that that is exactly the arctangent of X. I think we'll have no trouble finding the antiderivative of this power series. Antiderivative of one is X, then we have one third X cubed, 
We have uh, one fifth x to the fifth, and then minus one seventh x to the seventh, plus one ninth x to the ninth, and so on. Plus c. Again, it turns out that uh, if x is zero, this right side becomes only c. If x is zero over here, that's the arctangent of zero. That's gonna be the number whose tangent is zero. Oh, well, tangent of zero is zero, isn't it? Yes, tangent of zero is zero. So zero is equal to c. So again, this is equal to zero. And so we have another series. And this is, this is a particularly beautiful one. If x is equal to one, this side becomes exactly one minus a third times one plus a fifth times one minus a seventh times one and so on. While this side becomes, let's see, arctangent of one. That's the number whose tangent is one. And remember how we can think about that? If we had a square, we cut it in half. This angle is pi over four. These side lengths are both the same. I'm going to label them as both one. And if that's the case, this is the square root of two. So the number whose tangent is one, let's see, opposite over adjacent. Well, if opposite over adjacent is one, the angle I'm looking at is pi over four. So since, so we have tangent of pi over four is one, which means that the arc tangent of one is pi over four. So if I replace arctangent over, or if I replace x with one over here, I'm looking at arctangent of one, that's equal to pi over four. And so what this tells us is that I can write the number pi by, let's see, I'm just gonna multiply both sides by four here, as four minus four over three plus four over five minus four over seven plus four over nine and so on. Of course, that's presuming that one is in the interval on which this series converges. It does turn out that it is. We'll show that another time. But it gives us this beautiful representation of the number pi, the irrational number pi, the number whose decimal expansion has absolutely no repeating pattern to it whatsoever. Yet what we've uncovered is as a, as a series, we have a very beautiful pattern which represents this most important number in mathematics. I hope you've appreciated some of the power that power series offers. And I look forward to exploring more about this material in our next video. Until then, take care. Stay well. I'll see you then.